Welcome to Airway Breathing Conversation, a podcast presented by the anesthesiology residents at the University of Saskatchewan, created to provide individuals of all levels of medical knowledge with anesthesiology-related healthcare information. This episode is part of our abridged Grand Round series in which highly knowledgeable and sought-after guest speakers present on a multitude of fascinating topics relevant to anesthesia. Join us for Grand Rounds this week, where Dr. Oksana prokopchuk Gulk a transfusion medicine specialist and adult hematologist practicing in Saskatoon, Canada, presents on changes being made to platelet and plasma inventories at Canadian Blood Services. Now, whether you are an anesthesiologist, resident, medical student, or member of the general public, come listen in as we demystify the incredible specialty that is anesthesiology one episode at a time. So welcome today. Um, I'll be speaking about new and improved blood components coming to a theater near you. These are my disclosures. I will be discussing Canadian blood services quite a lot throughout this presentation, as well as uh, a product called Solvent Detergent Plasma or Octoplasma from Octopharma. I don't work for either of these companies, but certainly work closely with Canadian blood services given my role as a transfusion physician at the hospital level. So the objectives were previously circulated, and we'll just dive in, beginning with the first, to summarize the rationale for changes to platelet and plasma inventory at CBS. So I appreciate that via virtual audience, it's a little bit difficult to um, gather participation, but I'll ask that you look at these symbols and consider how they're tied together, because there's an extremely important point of history that we need to remember today that actually is the framework for why changes are happening in terms of the introduction of pathogen reduced blood components throughout Canada. So for those that may not be familiar, the first uh, top symbol with the two people in it is the symbol for the Canadian Haemophilia Society. Next to that is the Red Cross and then a unit of blood The bottom left-hand corner is the hepatitis C virus. The middle one is the HIV virus. And then the final tree of life is a commemoration symbol of the tainted blood tragedy by the Canadian Haemophilia Society. So there is a quote from 1905 uh, said by George Santayana that goes, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And so we really need to remember our lessons from the past that have shaped our future so that we don't repeat what occurred in the 1980s with the tainted blood scandal. So the younger audience, particularly residents, may or may not have heard of this um, prior to today. We need to recognize that there were recipients of blood components and products that contracted HIV and hepatitis from the Canadian blood supply between 1980 and 1990. At the time, the Canadian Red Cross was in charge of the blood supply. Um, And during that time, at least 2,000 recipients were infected by HIV and at least 30,000 infected by hepatitis C. This was the largest public health catastrophe in Canadian history. And because at the time, cryoprecipitate was the only factor replacement therapy for patients with hemophilia A containing factor eight, the hemophilia community was devastated. Um, We still have some patients that continue to live with HIV and hep C who are treated, but most have died. Root of the scandal was attributed to a number of decisions and non-decisions, quite frankly, by administrators and regulators of Canada's blood system of the time. And as a result, the Commission of Inquiry on the Blood System in Canada, called the Craver Inquiry, was initiated in October 1993. There's an excellent Canadian Encyclopedia article about this that's hyperlinked, and there are hyperlinks throughout this presentation for those that choose to review the slides later. I'll also mention that there is a CBC TV series called Unspeakable that's available um, online for free. It, w- it was released in 19, sorry, in 2019. For anyone who's interested in watching sort of a patient's perspective and, and what happened, the impact on families as a result of the tainted blood scandal. So the landmark report published by Creever re- was released in November 1997, and it exposed systemic failures of the Canadian Red Cross, Health Canada, and the federal and provincial governments to protect Canadians in the blood supply from tainted donor blood. 
The Creever Commission included 50 recommendations, which informed the creation and operation of a new national blood system beginning in September 1998. And as of that time, two blood operators were born in Canada, Canadian Blood Services, which provides blood and blood products to all Canadian provinces except Quebec. And then within that province is Hema, Quebec. Canada's reformed blood system has restored public confidence in blood safety by proactively addressing infectious risks, namely by adopting precautionary measures which were previously absent, and the creation of a government system prioritizing safety with the separation of funding from decision-making concerning patient safety. So that brings us to today and current donor blood component manufacturing processes at Canadian Blood Services. So before we jump into the pathogen inactivated side of things, it's important to frame what the current system is like. So for any blood donor that goes to Canadian Blood Services, there's a detailed pre-screening questionnaire with at least 26 questions on it uh, to ensure that there are no high risk activities that uh, are a part of that donor uh, at coming in. As long as the screening questionnaire is passed, there's standardized, standardized donor skin cleansing and collection processes during donation. That's followed by specific transmissible disease testing processes, which I will discuss briefly later. Uh, and then there's standard leukoreduction reduction by filtration to reduce the white blood cell content of red cells and platelets. There are some uh, nice images um, and descriptions available from the clinical guide to transfusion in chapter two, but very briefly, with the B1 Buffy Coat method, whole blood donors that come in um, essentially have their blood separated uh, into plasma platelets and red cells. And so each one unit of plasma or red cells um, then gets issued as a single donor unit to hospital, obviously, as long as all the testing checks and balances pass. Um, and then with the platelets, it's actually four whole blood donor Buffy coat platelets plus one pooled plasma from one of those donors that is um, combined into one bag. So when we're when any patient is receiving a Buffy coat unit of platelets or a pooled unit of donor platelets, that's four donor exposures uh, right within that bag. Uh, the B2 method is uh, employed throughout Saskatchewan because we don't have a component processing facility in Saskatchewan. Our blood is separated and processed at the Calgary facility before it's shipped back to Saskatchewan. Um, and so with that method, because it takes a little bit longer uh, to separate those products with the whole blood hanging in the refrigerator after passing through a leukoreduction reduction filter, only plasma and red cells are made from that method. So once again, Buffy coat platelets through the B1 method are four donor exposures. And throughout these processes with standard component manufacturing, there's no pathogen reduction methodology that's included. So anything we've been receiving within the blood banks up until now has just been standard, absolutely detailed questionnaires, cleansing, testing processes, leuco reduction in advance of that, but no pathogen inactivated technology applied to those units. So within our standard manufacturing, there, as mentioned, there's the red blood cells, the Buffy coat platelets and frozen plasma. And then of course, uh, donors can go to Canadian Blood Services and give um, apheresis or single donor platelets where they are essentially connected to a special machine that does that platelet separation out of the blood right at the bedside and collects just a bag of platelets, sometimes two if they have a robust count. And then in terms of frozen plasma, one or two units of frozen plasma can just be collected by apheresis as well. So again, these are the non-pathogen inactivated methods at this time. In terms of standard components, the transfusion transmitted infection risk for known viruses is extremely low at this point because of all of the safety steps that have been implemented. So with current donor screening collection and testing processes, risk of hepatitis B is one in about 2 million. HIV is one in about 12.9 million and hepatitis C one in 27 million. And these numbers are calculated uh, based on modeling from 2021. The risk of transfusion transmitted infections will never be zero because of the potential risk of donation during the viral window period. And so as a result, we always do need to consent our patients um, as a part of that informed consent process when they're about to receive transfusion or may receive transfusion that there is, there is some, albeit very low, risk of viral transmission. 
Bacterial contamination is also possible. Uh, blood components can be contaminated by donor skin organisms, including during blood donation because of unrecognized donor bacteremia, as well as environmental contamination from blood product handling. This is significantly higher in uh, platelet recipients in terms of the risk of uh, transfusion transmitted bacterial infection because of the room temperature seven day shelf life of those platelets. Red cells on the other hand are stored in the refrigerator. So there are standard risk reduction strategies like venipunctricite cleansing that's, that is um, standardized, diversion pouch, uh, which is essentially for any of those who have donated blood, a little mini pack um, that is um, filled first at the time of blood donation uh, prior to the main unit of blood that is collected. And that mini pack of blood may collect any skin plug that's cored out during venipuncture. Um, alternatively, it, it's also the, the pouch from which sampling uh, is taken for testing so that the main uh, blood collection pouch is not entered. And then of course the platelet unit culture is monitored at CBS uh, for 36 hours at this point, but um, up to seven days. Of course, we can't wait for those cultures to be complete before the units are released altogether because then the platelets would be expired. So after the first 36 hours with conventional uh, methods, um, then the platelets are released to the hospital. But if anything flags positive at CBS, we are notified right away. So as of 2021, there's a 15.6 per 10,000 platelet dose uh, contamination chance. So that doesn't translate into sepsis for all of those recipients, but there is just that chance of contamination uh, per 10,000 units. So I appreciate this is a very busy slide, but it's just to demonstrate that Canadian Blood Services does a lot in terms of testing in the background. So they um, have implemented testing first, first of all, uh, earliest was for syphilis back in 1949. They also test for hepatitis B by uh, protein-based as well as nucleic acid technology uh, or NAT methods, HIV by antibody-based as well as NAT methods as well, uh, HTLV, hepatitis C, West Nile virus, Chagas disease uh, for select donors who have a specific travel history as well as for bacteria. In addition to these tests, so this is for the standard blood components, any companies that work alongside Canadian Blood Services, that being the fractionators, um, also include additional steps to reduce the risk of uh, potential virus transmission. So we really need to consider then, okay, Canadian Blood Services is doing a great job, but what true transmission, transfusion transmitted infection risk is acceptable, right? So are these numbers that I've just quoted, is that okay? Or should we be doing better? And I think um, throughout the last 10 years, we have had a heightened sense of what's going to happen next because of the Zika virus and particularly with COVID-19. Neither Zika no, nor COVID-19 are transmissible by blood. But that's not to say that the next emerging transfusion transmitted or bloodborne pathogen isn't around the corner. Nobody expected HIV to happen. And at this point of time, we can only test for what we know. So what should we do next? Constant surveillance for emerging pathogens um, and, and other agents globally is constantly ongoing by international blood operators, including Canadian Blood Services. And there's actually um, a, an international group called the Alliance of Blood Operators or the ABO that do meet regularly and uh, communicate to ensure that um, any potential concerns or flags within the blood system are investigated right away to understand what the not just local but global risk to any uh, potential emerging pathogens may be. So to further improve our confidence in the blood supply, pathogen inactivation methods have been developed to improve that safety. So we'll be talking about two of those today. So there's pathogen inactivated technology or PIT, treatment of platelet and plasma donor components that can further reduce the risk of enveloped viruses. So specifically with PIT technology, that's HIV, HTLV and West Nile virus. Um, I'll say that both of these technologies are very effective at leukoreduction. So cytomegalovirus is also reduced, although all of our blood components um, do undergo the filtration process. So any 
uh, white blood cell transmitted infection risks are essentially nothing these days because of not just the leukofiltration or leukoreduction, but also these technologies. In terms of bacteria, both gram-positive, gram-negative, and spirochete uh, organisms are eliminated, as well as protozoan viruses uh, like malaria, babesia, um, as well. In terms of solvent detergent treatment of plasma, this further reduces the risks of envelope viruses, bacteria, protozoans, and very interestingly, prions like variant CJD. So um, that is one unique aspect of solvent detergent treatment as compared to pathogen inactivated technology applied to the platelets and plasma. This sounds great, it is great, the one thing to recognize is that there are no pathogen inactivated methods currently available, um, which are effective and applicable to red blood cells. So in terms of the consent process, um, when you're discussing transfusion transmitted risks with patients, everything that I just discussed in terms of the TTI risks are not going to be changed anytime soon for red blood cells. Those risks certainly are reduced in the context of pathogen inactivated uh, blood components, um, but um, with red cells, we are still we are still sort of working towards some kind of a pathogen inactivated technology that doesn't actually adversely impact the red blood cell quality. So next, I'll provide an overview of pathogen reduced platelet production and the impact of their introduction into our transfusion medicine lab or TML inventory. And with this second and the third objective as well, I'll just acknowledge a thank you to Canadian Blood Services for permission to adapt some of their slides for use in their presentation. From the perspective of terminology at CBS, the Cirrus Intercept pathogen inactivated technology has been adopted for use and manufacturing pathogen reduced platelet components. They're not using the intercept technology for platelets yet, or I'm sorry, for plasma yet, but certainly they're using it for platelets at this, at this time. So pathogen reduced platelets are known as, um, well, under several different names, but they all mean the same thing. So there's intercept platelets, pathogen reduced technology platelets, and sorolin treated platelets. So any of these terms mean the same thing. It's, it's these pathogen inactivated technology platelets. Um, more specifically, there are two different collection methods of platelets, as mentioned. There's the pooled platelet method, which um, I'll talk about shortly, and then the apheresis platelet uh, that's also sorolin treated. So again, if it's pooled, it comes from a pool of several donors, whereas an apheresis platelet comes from a single donor. So there's this component called an amotocillin, which is a synthetic sorolin that's added to platelet components um, to, to initiate the pathogen and activation steps. The amotocillin intercalates with nucleic acid of DNA and RNA in pathogen cells. Um, and when this amotocillin or the sorolin is exposed to UVA illumination at a very particular wavelength, Cross-linking damages the DNA or RNA, and this inactivates cells and pathogens within that unit. This is then followed by removal of any res residual amotocillin from the unit. So this technology has an excellent safety profile with toxicity extensively studied. I should mention that pathogen inactivated technology platelets have been commercialized uh, for use in Europe for nearly 20 years. So there is a robust body of evidence out of Europe that helps to support the introduction of this technology in Canada. Um, so several million units of platelets are treated globally uh, every year, plasma and platelets um, in Europe. And again, it's just going to be platelets in Canada at this point of time. So we have uh, a good reassurance that we're not adversely impacting our patients at all through this technology. So in terms of the pooled sorolin treated platelets, I know this is a very busy slide, but I'll just walk you through it very briefly. Um, so this begins with the collection of whole blood from donors at a CBS blood donor center. The whole blood units are then centrifuged to separate out the buffy coat. So again, it's that platelet um, layer that's in the middle between uh, the plasma and red cells. Um, that buffy coat is separated as uh, seven buffy coats together are then pulled together, one from each donor unit. So we look at seven donors, take the buffy coat, pull it into one bag, 
And then platelet additive solution is added to that large bag of seven pooled Buffy coats. This Buffy coat is then centrifuged and the platelet rich supernatant is extracted with um, the remaining red blood cells retained in the Buffy coat uh, through uh, platelet sparing leukoreduction filters. So the platelet layer itself will pass through this white blood cell reducing filter to produce essentially what's called a double dose pooled platelet. So again, still seven donor platelets in that bag. So the leukoreduced uh, large um, double dose platelet component undergoes pathogen inactivation. So this occurs with the addition of the amatocillin to that large pooled unit and exposure then to the UVA light, which inactivates the pathogens and white blood cells. And then the amatocillin is removed via a very specific absorption device. This large seven donor platelet is then split into two single dose pool platelet units and is ready for transfusion. And it's, it's uh, those split doses, the two single doses that are then shipped out to hospitals for transfusion. In terms of apheresis platelets, the process is very similar, um, but uh, rather than pooling seven different Buffy coats, there's just a large volume of platelets that's removed um, or, or taken, donated by um, the volunteer donor that comes into Canadian Blood Services. And so uh, the large unit has then uh, PAS or the um, uh, additive solution, platelet additive solution added into the bag. And then um, the, the subsequent steps include addition of uh, the amatocillin, exposure to UVA light, uh, and then those inactivation steps, and then the amatocillin is removed. So what is PAS, this platelet additive solution? So this solution was developed to actually replace plasma and the platelet components, because remember I said that standard platelet components um, are collected with four Buffy coats plus one plasma unit from one of those four donors. So in this case, yes, there are in the pooled donor platelet, there are seven donors, donor Buffy coats that are included before that unit is split. But rather than adding back one unit of plasma to those um, to that bag, this special platelet additive solution is added. So it's comprised of um, several elements, um, all of which are safe. It's an inert solution. And in addition to replacing plasma, it actually functions to dilute plasma proteins, cytokines, and isohemagglutinins like anti-A and anti-B that can adversely impact recipients, as well as um, it dilutes other bioactive molecules. Uh, we have found that it reduces the allergic and febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction risk and does not adversely impact hemostasis um, in any way. This is what the appearance of these bags is like. Um, so on the left side is a standard issue platelet, which you will be familiar with at this point. On the right is what the new platelet looks like. So color is a little bit different, a little bit paler, but also the bag is a little bit different. In terms of the ports, their they're functioning is the same. Functionality is the same. There's no change in spiking technique or tubing that's necessary. The bag appearance, again, a little bit different. It's made of a, a slightly different plastic and it does seem to be prone to show scratches or wrinkles. These are cosmetic only. So if you do notice any nicks on the bag, um, it, it is known that that can happen and it does not impact platelet quality at all. The labeling um, is a little bit different on the platelets. If you're wondering, is this a, is this a pulled platelet? Is this an apheresis platelet? Is it pathogen inactivated? Is it not? The bag always tells you that in the bottom left-hand corner. So this is an example of a pulled platelet that's leukocyte reduced, but also it very specifically says that it's sorrel and treated and divided. Okay, so um, a standard issue platelet will have pulled platelet, lupo reduced, and that's it. They it will not include that sorrel and treated detail. And of course, the blood group and RH is still on the bag, as well as um, the date of manufacture and then the date of expiry as well. In terms of indications for PIT platelets, essentially they're the same as for standard platelet transfusion. With the introduction of PIT platelets, there's nothing that's changed in terms of the platelet counts, the number of platelets transfused, the intervals of platelet transfusion. So we would just ask that you consult the transfusion best practice recommendations for uh, a, a reminder of those indications. 
but uh, clinically nothing has changed in this regard. The very um, useful thing for us, particularly on the blood bank side, is the pathogen inactivated technology process through the intercept system makes the units irradiation equivalent. So that means that any platelets we receive from CVS that have undergone um, processing via the intercept system no longer need to be irradiated. So essentially all units we receive now from CVS, if they're pathogen inactivated, they're considered safe for patients with irradiation indications, as well as those who are standard in terms of transfusion associated graft versus host disease reduction risk. And in order to reduce the burden uh, from hospitals, as well as to um, reduce any risks of error in terms of understanding is a platelet irradiated or not, any of the standard issue platelets that come to us from CBS right now are pre-irradiated as well. So essentially every platelet unit on the shelf as of July of this year in our center are, are all transfusion associated graft versus host disease safe, essentially. They're all essentially irradiated platelets. Um, so it's great because it actually has taken a huge time burden away from our techs needing to do that because it takes about eight to 10 minutes to irradiate a blood component. Certainly we still have to do this. We still have to irradiate red cells if anybody has indications for irradiation, but from the platelet side of things, we would always irradiate more platelets than red cells anyway. So this, is, this has been a huge time saver for us. So what are contraindications to PIT platelets? Well, you have to consider what general uh, contraindications to platelet transfusion may be. So bleeding unrelated to any decreased platelet number or abnormal function, right? So if it's bleeding due to something else, use the platelets wisely and don't give them. Um, and of course, platelet transfusion is relatively contraindicated in patients with a destructive or consumptive platelet disorder, except in the setting of life-threatening bleeding. So this is consistent, this is not new. In terms of what's specific to PIT platelets, if somebody is known to have a hypersensitivity, hypersensitivity to amatocillin or other sorolins, um, then they should not be given. To be fair, this is incredibly rare. Um, and the next one is interesting, um, citing that patients treated with phototherapy devices with a peak energy wavelength less than 425 nanometers or lower bound emission bandwidth less than 375 nanometers. This does not apply to neonatal phototherapy patients. That was extensively looked at to make sure that there was no concern with babies who need the Billy lights and things like that due to hyperbilirubinemia. If anything, there may be a small subset of patients who are undergoing extracorporeal photophoresis um, for indications like chronic graft versus host disease. Um, and our hematology and bone marrow transplant folks are aware of this. And, and we are in conversation to make sure that um, we keep our patients safe. But of, co of course, if a patient has a contraindication to PIT platelets, or is one of these photophoresis patients who is, um, who is undergoing treatment, we always still will have some standard platelets available, um, whether in our, in our inventories or upon request uh, from Canadian Blood Services. So there hasn't been a full 100% switch, but certainly the majority of our inventory has been switched over to PIT platelets. So as previously discussed, the benefits of PIT platelets are this additional layer of safety against a broad range of transfusion transmissible infections. Um, and this process really complements the donor selection criteria and pre-transfusion pathogen uh, testing for all donations. Really important to understand that none of the steps in terms of the questionnaires and the testing in terms of that big table that I showed are changing. All of that staying the same and the PIT processes are complementary to that sort of as an added level over and above um, what's already being done to reduce risks. There's also no need for back T bacterial screening before release into inventory, which is really exciting for us at the hospital level, because by the time we would get our Buffy coat platelets, um, or even to some extent the apheresis platelets, they would be sort of three days from collection, maybe four days from collection, which would mean that we only have two or three days um, uh, of those platelet life on our shelf. So, you know, it was really unfortunate sometimes when you would even receive platelets that were less than 48 hours from expiry. There was that hold or is that hold at CBS for a minimum of 36 hours plus then the transportation time, um, given the current processes of needing to hold platelets after cultures are taken. But with the PIT technology after the platelets are manufactured, there's that hold period of 36 hours has now been removed. 
Uh, finally, the PIT processes inhibit white cell replication and cytokine production. So once again, we don't need to irradiate those platelets. And I've already discussed how happy we are about that at the blood bank level. Safety endpoints from clinical trials and published hemovigilance data shows favorable adverse reaction and safety profiles. Um, there are fewer allergic and febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reactions. Along those lines, I think we're still trying to figure out exactly what those rates are so that when we are consenting patients for blood transfusion, we can quote more accurate numbers. Other than saying it's lower, that's pretty much all we can do at this point of time to know the standard risk rates um, with conventional blood transfusion and say that the, the risks of allergic and febrile non-hemolytic reactions are simply reduced um, with, with the PIT addition. There are no safety concerns in terms of thromboembolism, anaphylactic, acute reactions, adverse events in clinical trials, or differences in mortality or bleeding events. Um, and then in pediatric patients and neonates, uh, it, we, we talk about short-term short safety and efficacy because there is just limited data available, but there's no signal out of Europe at this point of time that there are any safety concerns in um, non-adult populations. Two minor drawbacks that we are certainly aware of, um, and you should be too, there does seem to be a lower platelet recipient count increment on post-transfusion CBC. So at one in four hours post-transfusion, we conventionally teach that the increment can be anywhere from 15 to 40 uh, points higher at one hour post-transfusion for a good increment. We're seeing that those ranges are less, sort of in the you know, 10 to potentially even 25, maybe 30 range. Um, but at the same time, studies that have looked at bleeding risk have not shown any difference. So that's the really important part. There is also potential for increased risk of transfusion requirements. This is particularly in patients with marrow failure disorder. 7% more platelet transfusions have been described on average in um, patients with malignancies. Um, and interestingly, platelet refractoriness was observed more often, which was somewhat a surprise. This seems not to be antibody mediated, but there's ongoing research in this regard so that we understand this better. Once again, the reassurance is that trials with pathogen-reduced platelets did not observe an increased bleeding risk due to fewer platelets in a platelet dose or due to those lower increments. So this is just one study, the PLATO trial, that, that has looked at patients with hematologic cancers and solid tumors, um, and again, provides that reassurance that we're not doing patients harm by using these platelets. So in Saskatchewan, the PIT platelets were introduced as of July 10th, 2023 in Saskatoon and Regina hospitals. We did distribute a communication in advance of that, and we're grateful to Canadian Blood Services for holding several information sessions to help educate our clinicians uh, and nurses. As of October 2023, these um, PIT platelets may be issued to other Saskatchewan sites depending on CBS inventory. So only Saskatoon and Regina hold platelets in their inventory as standard stock at this point. Any other transfusing facility in Saskatchewan can receive platelets for specific patient needs. For example, if there's a patient that lives in that community and requires outpatient transfusion, uh, depending on what the CBS depot has in Regina, as of October, rather than uh, simply diverting the PIT platelets to Saskatoon and Regina, they will be distributed to any site in Saskatchewan. The barrier to a province-wide introduction right off the hop has been just making sure our lab information systems have codes built to be able to accept those platelets into inventory because, of course, the PIT platelets have different ISBT codes um, than the standard issue platelets. There are additional resources um, included as hyperlinks here if anyone wants to do any additional further reading uh, in the coming weeks. And that takes us to our final objective, comparing and contrasting frozen plasma and solvent detergent plasma for transfusion and discussing the clinical impacts of this product. So this graphic just details or summarizes uh, the CVS journey towards pathogen reduced plasma. So this is something that CVS has been looking at since uh, 2007, when they hosted an international consensus conference on pathogen and activation technologies, which even at the time included solvent detergent treatment for plasma. Um, at that point, Europe was really expanding its availability of 
solvent detergent plasma. So certainly North America was trying to understand what role this had in our transfusion system. As of 2023, transition to the SD plasma product um, has begun. The goal is that by September of 2023, so the end of September 2023, at least 80% of the plasma use in Canada will have been transitioned to octoplasma. So that is our supplier of the solvent detergent plasma at this time. Uh, the introduction of uh, collected pathogen reduced plasma has been tentatively made for 2024, 2025. So this means in addition to the octoplasma from Octopharma, CBS is hoping to have their own um, pathogen inactivated plasma produced in-house so that we're not dependent on a sole single source supplier. And that will hopefully backfill the 20% um, uh, stock within Canada to make sure that we at least have some in-country supply. Um, and then finally, in 2025, the goal is that uh, the great majority of all platelets and plasma uh, for transfusion be completely pathogen and activated method uh, based. Um, so that would, it would be uncommon for recipients to receive the standard non-pathogen inactivated platelets or plasma. So solvent detergent plasma is a pathogen reduced form of frozen plasma uh, that reduces the risk of transfusion transmitted viral and other adverse reactions. So we've already talked about this a bit. Uh, viruses, bacteria, protozoan, parasites are all removed and then prions as well. Important to understand SD treatment, just like the intercept uh, system for platelets is not effective against non-enveloped viruses like hepatitis A and parvo B19 but there are other risk reducing steps in place by the manufacturer, which I'll mention in the next couple of slides. So you might wonder, okay, well, if SD plasma has been available for use in Europe since 2007, and it's been on the market, why haven't we had it? Well, that's a good question. And it actually comes down to uh, cost effectiveness and recommendation following a cost analysis complements of CADIS. So access was restricted following this review was pu review publication in 2011. And octoplasma was available, but only for special populations meeting defined criteria. That predominantly included patients who had had some kind of a very severe allergic type reaction um, to frozen plasma or had some other contraindication to frozen plasma where SD plasma then had to be reviewed and considered uh, sort of as a special access product. However, as of March, those restrictions have been lifted. And the expansion of access broadly at this time was determined to be timely and now cost effective. Um, the price point of the SD plasma has changed, um, allowing this broader introduction and of course the recognized benefits of the pathogen reduced uh, product availability throughout Canada. So the time has just been now, which is great. So in terms of plasma manufacturing, this is a very busy slide, but very briefly, plasma is pooled from anywhere between 630 and 1,500, 1,500 donors um, as a part of this uh, manufacturing. So huge vats of donor plasma are pooled uh, prior to uh, processing with the solvent detergent treatment. I'll also just underscore that the companies aggressively um, will screen their donors. So the plasma for octoplasma production does not come from Canadian Blood Services at this point of time. It will come from Octopharma collection facilities. Um, so those donor screening processes are very aggressive as well. They have testing processes implemented in addition to the pathogen inactivated technology that's applied um, uh, the solvent detergent treatment rather that's applied to the plasma. So um, anywhere between 600 and 1500 donor pools are combined, um, which then through dilution process lowers the antibody teeters against any other blood cells and plasma protein. The pooled plasma then undergoes sterile filtration steps, uh, including white blood cell removal without um, activating any of these white cells, in addition to the removal of prions, parasites, and viruses, as we had said. 
The pooled plasma is then treated with the solvent TNBP and then the detergent octoxinol. And then this uh, solvent environment creates a situation where the lipid coats are degraded, detergent treatment can happen effectively. And then in addition to um, lipid uh, coating removal from bacteria and viruses, there's also a prion inactivation step through a uh, special filter. The solvent and detergent reagents are removed prior to the final product uh, being available for packaging and shipping to recipients. So as mentioned, at the collection facilities, there are controls applied to select, specifically select donors to make sure they're low risk individuals and who are tested um, to be negative for the classic enveloped viruses. But these companies also employ nucleic acid testing for non-enveloped viruses like hepatitis A, E, and parvovirus B19. So although the solvent detergent treatment doesn't destroy those viruses, there is additional testing of these three viruses by those manufacturers um, to ensure that the plasma pools um, are risk reduced, at least in terms of transfusion transmission. So this is a visual comparison of what those bags looked like. Um, the very important thing to note, and I'll be addressing this a little bit further as well, is the fact that octoplasma units are a standard volume of 200 milliliters. So frozen plasma, on the other hand, can range between 150 to 300 mils. So when you're ordering a unit of plasma at this point of time, you can get a huge range of volume in any one bag. If you're curious to know, well, how much is in the bag? It's always printed on the bag. So you can always see what the volume is, but we don't make any specific choices of what volumes we're issuing um, based on the volume that's printed. If it's a unit, it's a unit. With octoplasma, the volume does matter at 200 mils um, because of the potential for actually underdosing patients if you're requesting plasma based on a consideration of um, milliliter per kilogram dosing, which should be done for everyone. In terms of pharmacokinetic properties, the octoplasma is very similar to that of frozen plasma. All coagulation factor activity levels must be at least 50%, um, and values are actually more consistent in the octoplasma, so you know you're getting a more consistent range of coagulation factors within that product compared to single donor frozen plasma. And the clinical efficacy is similar as well. So this slide is just for reference, but it's just to demonstrate that even those min-max intervals, as well as the means, um, but mostly the min-max intervals are more, are tighter. They're more consistent unit to unit um, compared to fresh frozen plasma. Now, we're talking about frozen plasma versus, versus fresh frozen plasma. CBS only issues frozen plasma at this time. That just means that the units have been frozen within 24 hours of collection, whereas fresh frozen plasma is frozen at up to eight hours from collection. So that being said, we anticipate that these reference ranges are very similar for frozen plasma versus fresh frozen plasma, but just so you understand where the terminology difference comes from. Coagulation factor levels are predominantly parallel in the octoplasma compared to frozen plasma. There's, there is a modest reduction of protein S uh, as well as alpha-2 antiplasmin. But the reduction in protein S does mean that the one patient population where we do need to use caution um, with octoplasma or potentially even choose frozen plasma is anyone with congenital severe protein S deficiency, which is very rare, um, seen predominantly by hematology. Those patients have thrombosis risks that uh, are quite high, but um, that would be the one patient group to be aware of. So from an anesthesia perspective, it's unlikely you'll be encountering those patients. Um, so in terms of dosing considerations, as mentioned, the recipient weight-based dosing is really important to be aware of. Um, in typically, I mean, they usually are bleeding or preoperative, but otherwise hemodynamically stable patients, the recommended dose of plasma is 10 to 15 mils per kilogram. And that's whether you're using frozen plasma or uh, solvent detergent plasma. This dose is such to increase coagulation factor levels that are circulating in the recipient by at least 20%. So if you have someone who's bleeding and has a prolonged PTT and INR, the prolongation in PTT and INR uh, means that at, if you're at an INR greater than 1.7 or at a PTT that's over 40 seconds, 
your coagulation factor levels, at least one or some combination of them will be near or at a 30% level. So you want to, or even lower, right? So you want to actually increase your uh, coagulation factors that are circulating to somewhere over 30% and ideally closer to 50% so that you have achievement of hemostasis. If you or order only one or two units of plasma, this is always under dosing and you get a friendly call from your neighborhood transfusion physician to actually ask, do you need plasma? And if so, can we offer you more? Because it's a, it's an, it's sort of a go big or go home product. You order the correct dose or you don't use any, but one or two units is only going to expose individuals to potential complications of, of plasma transfusion, but not actually achieve your hemostatic target. The important point about the 200 mil volume is if you're doing these calculations in larger patients, you may actually need more plasma than you thought. So for example, in a 70 kilo patient, if you're achieving a 15 mil per kilo dose, that's about a thousand mils. So that's actually five units of SD plasma, but typically would be four units of frozen plasma. So the unit-based dosing is staying. You know, we're not gonna be asking you to order in mils at all, but just be aware that if you are looking at what the appropriate dose for your patient may be, um, it may be one unit higher than what you would typically order. Ratio-based dosing relative to red blood cell uh, units issued is employed in massively bleeding patients. So in terms of our massive hemorrhage protocol boxes, if the protocol has been four units red cells, four units of plasma, frozen plasma, we are now just substituting one for one. So four units red cells, it'll be four units SD plasma. As always, lab results should be used to guide additional dosing of plasma. Um, if you'd like to request an additional dose of plasma in the box, sure, no problem. Um, or maybe the plasma's coagulation factor uh, parameters are actually more abnormal than you'd expect and you actually need six units, that's fine. Um, you just need to be aware uh, that these bags are smaller and your dose may end up changing in terms of the absolute number of units. Um, so as mentioned, ordering number of units for adults or volume, of course, is staying the same for pediatrics. Um, the units must be ABO uh, blood group compatible, just like frozen plasma. There's been some question about, does it take longer to thaw um, SD plasma as compared to frozen plasma? We've done an in-house comparison within the RUH transfusion lab, and we have observed that it takes approximately five minutes longer to thaw um, SD plasma as compared to frozen plasma. So even with this five minutes longer, the total thaw time is around 20 minutes, between 20 and 25 minutes. So really we always say that your plasma can take up to 30 minutes to thaw. So based on what the conventional, um, again, teaching has been, yes, teaching that plasma gets out the door within 30 minutes, it has been a little bit quicker in terms of 15 to 20 sometimes for frozen plasma. But here we're still gonna be under that 30 minute mark at around 20 to 25 minutes. Um, so clinically, we feel that this is not going to make a difference and in terms of um, access. And then the National Advisory Committee on Blood and Blood Products has also um, uh, issued a statement saying that really in terms of frozen plasma and SD plasma, um, they're, they're considered clinically equivalent, should be treated the same way in terms of lab processing and issue as well. Higher doses um, or infusion rates of SD plasma can induce TACO. This is no different than for um, frozen plasma. If you, you're infusing huge volumes into a patient, it's not just red cells that can cause a TACO. So just be aware that that circulatory overload can be a real thing with any plasma transfusion. Um, with SD plasma, you know, there don't have to be any additional modifications to your um, rapid infusers or blood warmers. Just use them the same way you've always been using them. And then um, the other question we've received is what about citrate toxicity? Is there a risk of citrate toxicity with SD plasma? So there is, however, it's no different than with frozen plasma. So the risk is not increased in any way. The product monograph does discuss a max infusion rate of one mil per kilo body weight per minute. So in a 70 kilo person, that would be 70 mils per minute. That in and of itself is a pretty fast infusion rate. Um, and again, is really no different than what the awareness of a max infusion rate should be for frozen plasma at this point anyway. 
Indications for SD plasma are the same as for standard plasma transfusion. And again, I'll refer you to the best practice recommendations. In general, plasma is used for replacement of deficient coagulation factors in patients with active bleeding or prior to surgery or invasive procedures where any protein concentrates are not available. So for example, if it's a warfarin patient, we have PCC. You wouldn't use plasma or SD plasma in that setting anyway. So again, consult the best practice recommendations for that full list. Contraindications to SD plasma, very few. So in general, we have to have caution for any blood recipients receiving um, blood, whether it's red cells, plasma, anything, if they have documented IgA deficiency with antibodies against IgA. So again, this is extremely rare and usually the transfusion medicine physician is involved. We are happy to discuss cases if you think you have a patient like this, um, but again, really rare. Um, specific to SD plasma, so as mentioned, if there's a severe deficiency of congenital protein um, S um, because of a mutation, right? So the protein S level sort of less than 30%. So really rare. Um, and this is because the octoplasma product has less protein S levels as compared to frozen plasma. Um, and of course, any hypersensitivity to plasma or any ingredient within the SD plasma formulation, um, we are happy to be involved with you if something like this comes up. And of course, if a patient has a contraindication to octoplasma, there is still that 20% of inventory that will remain um, as frozen plasma. In terms of special populations, you're probably thinking, well, what about peds? What about neonates? So in the available literature, um, there are no safety concerns in pediatrics that, are, that have been published, and SD plasma should be considered equally effective. Um, more limited data available in the neonatal population, uh, but based on what we've seen coming out of Europe, no safety concerns have been identified. I will say that practically, um, Optopharma has not supplied us with any bag sizes less than 200 milliliters. And once those bags are thawed, even just based on the ports and tails that are on them, we can't split those plasma units within our blood bank. So if neonates require transfusion, right? This is small volumes, usually on the order of 50 milliliters or less than that even. Um, we are still issuing them divided packs of frozen plasma only because of bag size available. If um, we are being asked for plasma for a neonate and it's not specified, we'll be issuing these frozen plasma divided packs until um, the company, until Octopharma starts manufacturing smaller units. However, if some physician specifies they'd like SD plasma, we, we will provide an SD plasma unit, but then the full unit is issued to the ward and it's up to the nursing teams to be very careful to only administer the small volume that's necessary and then the rest of the pack is discarded. So this is just an inventory management um, consideration in terms of practicalities of bag sizes as it relates to the top up transfusions of plasma for neonates. If there are neonates that need exchange transfusion for hyperbilirubinemia, um, we are using the SD plasma to combine with red cells within the blood bank to mix up that whole blood. And then finally, in pregnancy, based on limited data, again, there's no reason to expect um, any difference in efficacy and no safety concerns have been identified. Um, in terms of benefits, of course, we've discussed the extensive enhanced safety profile. One of the things that we really like is that there's a consistent coagulation factor concentration, and there is published evidence, particularly from the uh, plasma exchange population, especially those with TTP who have been receiving plasma exchange with SD plasma, that there's a decreased incidence of adverse reactions due to the lipid removal and dilution of potentially implicated donor antibodies or proteins. So there has been a documented um, reduction in allergic reactions, trolley, as well as immune related reactions. Um, and then in, in terms of the blood system as a whole, because the octoplasma comes from a purchase manufacturer, um, any plasma currently collected in Canada is, um, available within the blood system for fractionation to make other things, predominantly IVIG. So whenever there's one shift in inventory in the blood system, something else becomes impacted. And here it is a benefit 
But this is where I say that, you know, up until now, um, the donor plasma in Canada has been from Canadian donors received as frozen plasma transfusion, has not been pathogen inactivated. But at this point, the pathogen inactivated technology or method solvent detergent plasma we're getting from Octopharma, the Octoplasma is predominantly from European donors. So very safe, um, but for awareness is it, it is coming from across our borders. So ST plasma has been broadly introduced by CVS as of March, 2023, with this inventory transition begun in Saskatoon and Regina this August. Um, we did uh, uh, ask the OR9, so our cardiac surgery suite, to begin transition a little bit sooner, particularly so we could um, do our thaw time uh, validations. And we appreciate that. So they started a bit sooner, but everybody else should be seeing the SD plasma on the wards anytime now. Um, and uh, we are expecting that we will be fully transitioned um, within Saskatoon and Regina. Uh, by the end of September and only have a very small sort of backup supply of frozen plasma hereafter. So it will it will be SD plasma that you're seeing. Additional resources are listed here for anyone who'd like to do some further reading. So that brings me to the end. So lessons from the past have helped shape today's blood system and the pathogen inactivation methods are truly essential in helping to mitigate the risk of transfusion transmitted infections, especially those that may be emerging pathogens uh, that we would like to avoid. We don't want to have another tainted blood scandal. Uh, we need to learn from the past and do everything we can to, to prevent a similar occurrence in the future. Uh, PIT platelets and SD plasma do have a lower transfusion adverse reaction risk profile compared to non-pathogen inactivated blood components. Clinical indications for standard and pathogen inactivated components are the same. And our inventories now include these products. Um, so you will be seeing them in clinical practice. You've been listening to Airway Breathing Conversation, a podcast hosted and presented by the anesthesiology residents at the University of Saskatchewan. Please note that while this podcast is run by healthcare professionals, it is intended for educational and entertainment purposes only. We are very thankful to our guests for taking the time to share their wisdom with us this episode, and a very special thanks to you, our listeners, for tuning in. Don't forget to follow us and our associated USASC Anesthesia accounts on social media. You can find all our social media links on our Linktree page at linktr.ee slash abc underscore podcast. You can also find the department's social media links on their Linktree page at linktr.ee slash usask underscore anesthesia. We'll see you next episode, but until then, stay calm, take a breath, and always remember your ABCs.